Paul is exhorting Timothy. And we can see Paul's legacy to all of us, a spiritual heritage. He said, I have kept the faith. I fought the good fight, and I have finished my race. I was thinking if Jesus tarries another hundred years and church history is written, what will they say about us? What will they say about the church of today, our generation, our churches in Africa, the churches in America? And I pray that when that history is written in the future, they will say about the church of today is that they fought the good fight. They kept the faith and they finished the race and they handed that baton to the next generation. Amen? Amen. We want to leave a spiritual legacy. I guess I'm at the age now I'm thinking of these kind of things. The legacy that we will leave, that Jennifer and I will leave to the next generation and to the, the ones who will follow us into the future. And I want the church here and also in Africa to make a difference in this generation. The time that we have been given, we want to do something significant for the kingdom of God. Have you ever felt like there's something deep on the inside of you? It's just sort of burned sometime. You say, I really want to do something great. I want to do something to say thank you for so great a salvation, an eternal life. There's just something burning on the inside of you. And I feel the Spirit of God speaking to us all today. We can do something of eternal worth. I want us all to leave a legacy, a spiritual heritage to our children, to our grandchildren, and to those who will follow us into the future. Now, some men and women, they start off well, but they don't end well. And I want all of us here today to finish well. Amen. We have a purpose and a destiny to fulfill. And all of us can make a difference in one way or another in our generation may not be going to a foreign field and serving as a missionary. It may not be becoming a pastor in a full-time church, but it can be volunteering as an usher, <clears throat> children's ministry, and doing something, though, that will impact this next generation. All these children running up and giving their offerings, it blessed me. Because those of you who are teaching them and teaching them to give, you don't know if they're the next Paul, if they're the next Reinhard Bonnke, if they're the next T.L. Osborne, or Billy Graham. You don't know who they are as we speak and as we train them and we raise them up. Amen? In Luke 17, 32, Jesus said something very interesting. <clears throat> he said, remember Lot's wife. Now, here's a woman who is being remembered, and we all know what she's being remembered for. She looked back. And I have a word for, uh, for someone here today. You've come too far to turn back now. Hallelujah. You've been discouraged. Some things have been going on, and you're starting, to, you're starting to look back. Listen, you've come too far. You've come too far to turn back now. You know, it's a funny thing, that the things we remember. Amen? I remember singers, and this will show my age. I remember Elvis Presley growing up. I remember the Beatles, things that we remember. I remember songs, songs that take us to another time and another place. I was blessed by the songs we were singing this morning because it took me back to my Baptist upbringing and the songs we would sing on Sunday morning and the songs that I remember and the songs that made an impact in my life. I remember the first astronaut, Alan Shepard, as he went into space. I was in junior high school, and the principal had it over the PA system so we could hear the, the blast off and when he came back down, and I remember that day. I remember movies. I remember a movie called Hatari, and it was with John Wayne, and uh, it was about Kenya, and the word Hatari means danger, and uh, I remember that as a young boy. I remember 1963 when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. My mother came to the school uh, that day to get me out of school. I was 15 years old, and we never missed school for any reason. I don't know how your mother and dad were, but you didn't miss school. And my mother knocked on the door you know, and talked to the teacher, and they let me out. And she said, I'm going to take you to see the president. And so we went downtown Fort Worth, and we stood there as the, as the cars went by. And uh, he, I saw the Kennedy. I saw Johnson. I saw everybody. And he was waving, and I think he was waving at me. It, it looked like he saw me in the crowd standing there. I went back to school, and one hour later, the news hit. He had been 
shot and killed. I remember that day. I remember August the 7th, 1998, when the bomb blast went off in Nairobi, Kenya. Thousands of people hurt, hundreds killed. I remember 2001 when the planes hit the towers. The things we remember. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. What will the church of the future remember about us? What will they say about us in the future? How can we live a life in order to fulfill our purpose and to leave a legacy? This morning, I want to give you five things. I believe that if you do, you can live a good life and leave a legacy for those who follow. Number one, you got to have a vision. Amen? Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, write the vision so that others may read it and then run with it. All of us, I believe, need a vision, not only for a ministry or for a church, but I think we need a vision for our own lives and where we're going. Uh, if I ask you today, what do you see for yourself for three years from now? Do you have a vision for three years from now and where you want to be? Do you have a vision for five years or where you want to be? And what do you want to be doing? And what are you doing today that would lead to that? Amen? In uh, Proverbs 29, 18, it says, When there is no vision, the people perish. Another translation says, When there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. And that means that they have no vision. They don't know where they're going. And they're just, if, if you have no vision, then you've already arrived. Amen? You're already where you're going because you have no vision of where you're going. So any place is a good place. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, it talks about, earlier in the scriptures, it was talking about some of the virtues. that if all these things in your life, you will never stumble. And when I was reading that, I, 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 I brought that along to also in a vision, having vision. Because if you have clear vision about your life, you will never stumble. Amen? You're, you know, people, it seems like sometimes you're going through life and we stumble. Something is happening. And we have to sort of rethink what we're doing. And then we hit another circumstance and we stumble again. But I believe if you have a clear vision of where you're going and what you want to accomplish, amen, I believe you will never stumble. People have asked me, did, ha, did you really see what God was going to do, you know, after 30-something years? You know, Jennifer and I, I was a businessman uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, I had been raised Baptist. Uh, Jennifer had been raised Methodist. We got married in the Lutheran church. <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes God takes you on a journey. And we were looking for something. We knew we, we, we didn't have what we were looking for. We ended up joining Church on the Rock in Rockwall, Texas. And that's where God began to speak to us about our future and where we were going to go. And began to give us, a, give us a vision, a vision for our life. And that though circumstances, like the cancers and the things, have been, but you know what? We know where we're going. He said, did you imagine all of this 35 years ago? I said, well, yes. I saw it, but it was like a telescope. You see, I can see the elder there, you know. But all of you are here. Amen. So I could only see what I saw straight down the road, and that's what we went for. And as we got closer, it began to expand. The churches, the homes, the schools, and everything began to expand. Hallelujah. So you've got to have a vision. If you don't have a vision, I say it like this. Get with someone who has a vision. Amen. And rub up against them. You know, and say... You know, I need vision for my life, you know, and I want to get with somebody who has a vision, who has an anointing or something that I can catch some of that vision. I heard a story in Nairobi, Kenya one time, and I'm not sure if I can do it from here, but I'll try. Anyway, it was a, they were walking down the streets of Nairobi, and there was a man on a tall building, and uh, he was going to jump off, and they could tell he was going to kill himself. And so there was a group of people down below, and you know, there's always two sides to this. Some were yelling, don't jump. Some were yelling, go ahead and jump, because that's the way people are. And so finally they decided they would send one young man up there 
to talk him off that tall building. So he goes up, and they're watching, and he's talking to them, and they join arms, and he's talking, and the, the young man is talking back, and they finally both went, okay. They both joined arms, and they both jumped. Listen, <laughs> join yourself together with someone who has a vision. Don't join together with someone who has no vision for their life. Hallelujah. Because he talked him into jumping with him because he got discouraged. Amen. So get a vision. Know where you're going. The second thing, you've got to maintain your values. And we're talking about five things to do to leave a legacy, to leave a spiritual heritage to those who follow. So number one, you've got to have a vision. Number two, you need to maintain your values. The core values of that, that's who you are, the DNA makeup, your values, the Christian values that we all believe and we stand for. You don't want to compromise your values. You maintain those values. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about some of the virtues, some of the patience and things that we need to have in, in our life. And we need to maintain those values. Number three, you got to be a willing vessel. A willing vessel. Have a vision, maintain your values, and be a willing. You know what that means when a preacher looks at his watch? Absolutely nothing. It was just something I do. Hallelujah. Told you I was a prophet. <laughs> be a willing vessel. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 20 and... Uh, 20 and 21. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. We need to be willing vessels. We need to be willing for the Holy Spirit of God to just fill us and then use us to carry out his work, and to help establish his kingdom, his kingdom on this earth. Acts chapter 9, let's look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 15. Acts 9 verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of of Israel. Verse 16 says, well, I'll show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Of course, we're talking about the road to Damascus, talking about that, uh, how Paul is going to be used. Uh, Ananias, the Lord is talking to Ananias, they go lay your hands on him, and Ananias is saying, you know, I know who this man is. This man has been persecuting the church. And then he says, no, he's going to be, a, he is a chosen vessel. Listen, you are a chosen vessel of God for him to fill you, to sanctify you, that you will carry out his will on this earth. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a willing, you're a vessel. You're a vessel. Help me preach this. You're a vessel. You're a vessel to be used of God. Hallelujah. Get a vision. It's so important to have a vision for your life and where you're going to go. If you're young and you want to be, you're thinking about your education, what is it you want to accomplish? What is it you want to do? Uh, for those of us in middle age, I'm still in middle age, I think. Not sure about that. But I have a vision. I know where I want to be in five years. I know where I want to be in ten years. Jennifer and I have talked about uh, retirement. And when we decided on our 60th wedding anniversary, we will probably retire. I'll be 88 and she'll be 85. We thought that might be a good time, maybe to slow down just a little. But we thank God that we have this opportunity to serve him, to be a willing vessel. We maintain the values that are part of our life. I do a teaching on the core values of Church on the Rock and what we believe in Church on the Rock Africa. We've got eight core values, our DNA of who we are, what we believe. Many, many years ago, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit spoke to me a word, and he said, and then there came one 
who knew not Joseph. And I began to realize that in the future, a hundred years from now, there will come people who will don't, they won't know David and Jennifer Hatley. They won't know what we laid down and what we laid our lives down for. They won't know that. But what they will know is the vision that we've laid down. We don't care if they remember our name, but we want them to see the vision. We write it out, walk in that vision, the character of the churches and the people who follow us. They may not remember our name, but they will remember the vision that we had and the values that we had and how that we were willing vessels to be used of God during this generation. What will the church of the future say about us? What will they say about the different things that have been going on? How will we leave a legacy to our children, to our grandchildren, and to those who follow? I believe we've got to have a clear vision of where we're going as a church, as an organization, as a family, and as a person. You've got to have a clear vision of where you're going. You've got to maintain the values of your life. What's important to you? You need to write those things down. Write it down. What's important to you? What values do you cherish? What virtues do you cherish in your life? And begin to work on them and make sure that they're part of who you are and the DNA of what you believe. And then be a willing vessel saying, Lord, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I will do. I said those words in Rockwall, Texas in 1983 when the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and there was a man from India and Africa. We went to a missions meeting. I didn't want to be a missionary, but our pastor David Shibley invited Jennifer and I to that missions meeting for a couple of reasons. And, but I remember going to the meeting going, I don't want to be a missionary. To me, a missionary was the guy with the black rim glasses with a tape, the white shirt and the real thin black tie. And I, I didn't want to be a missionary. I wanted to be rich. We had businesses. You, you know what? Come on now. You know what I'm talking about. You know, and uh, we had a house with a swimming pool, driving a Cadillac. I mean, you know, I, I wanted to know how I could get more of this. And uh, but then I found out God didn't want more of that. He wanted more of me. Amen. And I remember going outside that night of February night. It was cold. The sky was clear. And I, that night I said, it's not my life anymore. It is your life. It, it, I belong to you now. I'll be that willing vessel. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love. Fill me with your direction, your purpose. And I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything. It was a surprise he called Africa. I was thinking Hawaii. <laughs> well, come on, you know. And then I realized that with my body, beach ministry was not going to be my forte. That uh, they probably wouldn't allow me in a bathing suit trying to minister to people up and down the beach. So, But anyway. But God called us to Africa. I had a pastor tell me once, I'm so glad God called you to Africa and not me. I said, so am I. So am I. You probably would have done a better job. You're better educated. You've been to seminary. You've been to Bible school. I've been to none of those. But I've been to the cross. I've been to the cross. And I've heard the voice of God in my life. And he spoke to my heart, spoke to Jennifer's heart. And there's no turning back. Hallelujah. We've come too far now to turn back. We're never turning back. We're still going, still moving. Vision is still happening. Vision is still coming into our hearts. After the, I think it was two children's homes ago, Jennifer said, this is our last, we're not going to do any more of this. This is our last one. We built that. Then we did another one. So this time she said, this is our last one. I said, don't say that anymore. Every time you say we're finished, God brings something else into our lives for us to do. But I think it's a good thing. It keeps us on the cutting edge. Amen? On the cutting edge. There is no retirement in the army of God. No retirement. You just keep moving forward. So be willing vessels. Number four, you've got to understand your vindication. Understand your vindication. Look in Psalm 17 and verse 2. Psalm 17 and verse 2. It says, let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look upon the things 
that are upright. The fourth thing you've got to do as you're walking and as you're living, understand your vindication. Understand you have been made free. Hallelujah. And the word vindication means simply declared innocent. Hallelujah. When Jesus went to the cross, he declared you innocent. All the sins that had been written against us were nailed to the cross. And the blood was shed. And he said, that one's innocent. They've been declared innocent. You've been declared innocent today. Listen, don't let the past define you. Amen? A lot of people let the past define who they are today. Be defined by your future. I'm praying that today some of you will have a defining moment in your life. may not happen today, but maybe this week. There will come a defining moment and to define who you are, where you're going, and what you're going to be. Hallelujah. Jennifer and I had that defining moment, I told you, on that February night. It was cold, but it was a defining moment in our life that determined what we were going to be doing with the rest of our lives. And I look back in my life, remembering some of the things, and at different points in my life, there was a defining moment. I was going one direction, something would happen, and I would go this direction. And it was a defining moment. Don't let the past... You know, a lot of people struggle with their past, past addictions, uh, past problems, circumstances. And a lot of times you let that begin to define who you are today. You've been vindicated. You've been declared innocent. You need to receive that today. And as you're walking through life, getting that vision, maintaining your values, be a willing vessel and understanding God has set you free. Amen. He's declared you innocent. Yes. Now, you know the devil. Well, I don't know if you know him, but you've heard of him. <laughs> he likes to come to you and whisper in your ear and say, you remember? See, he likes for you to remember, too. You remember when you were 15 years old? Remember that summer? Remember you were at the lake? You remember that? You go, yeah, yeah, I, begin to re- yeah, I sort of remember that. You know? No, 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 no. Don't be defined by that past be defined your future and where you're going you have been declared pray for those defining moments in your life where God will define who you are as a person and as a minister and we're all ministers the word minister just means servants we are all servants of the most high God the ministry is just the act of serving if you've been called into the ministry you've just been called into an act of service to the most high God Number five, walk in the victory. So the fifth thing is you begin to walk in that victory. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and verse, uh, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God gave us the victory, and we're to walk in that victory that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to us. When he went to the cross, he gave us victory over sin. He gave us victory over our past. He gave us victory that day to walk into the future and be what God has called us to be. He's called us to be his servants. He's called us to be righteous men and righteous women. He's called us to be righteous parents. He's called us to be. Hallelujah. And we need to walk in that victory. You know, hold your head up. A lot of people go through life with their head down. Amen. They do. Hold your head up. You're a child of the living God. We're not talking about pride. We're talking about who you are. Who you are as a child of God. You're somebody in the kingdom of God. Keep your chin up. And smile at people. Y'all can smile at me. It'll be all right. Some of you are smiling. Some of you haven't smiled at me since I stood up here. You go, yeah, yeah, I begin to re- yeah, I sort of remember that. You know? No, 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 no. Don't be defined by that past. Be defined by your future and where you're going. You have been declared. Pray for those defining moments in your life where God will define who you are as a person and 
as a minister, and we're all ministers. The word minister just means servants. We are all servants of the Most High God. The ministry is just the act of serving. If you've been called into the ministry, you've just been called into an act of service to the Most High God. Number five, walk in the victory. So the fifth thing is you begin to walk in that victory. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 and verse, uh, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God gave us the victory, and we're to walk in that victory that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to us. When he went to the cross, he gave us victory over sin. He gave us victory over our past. He gave us victory that day to walk into the future and be what God has called us to be. He's called us to be his servants. He's called us to be righteous men and righteous women. He's called us to be righteous parents. He's called us to be. Hallelujah. And we need to walk in that victory. You know, hold your head up. A lot of people go through life with their head down. Amen. They do. Hold your head up. You're a child of the living God. We're not talking about pride. We're talking about who you are. Who you are as a child of God. You're somebody in the kingdom of God. Keep your chin up. And smile at people. Y'all can smile at me. It'll be all right. Some of you are smiling. Some of you haven't smiled at me since I stood up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's, you know, when a preacher's preaching, he likes to see smiles, you know. It makes him feel like he's doing something up here. Hallelujah. But we need to walk in the victory that Christ has given us. We have been victorious. To have a fruitful, productive life and fulfilling your purpose... You've got to have a clear vision, number one. You've got to maintain your values. Don't compromise your values. Don't compromise your beliefs. Be a willing vessel that God can use and to fill. And understand your vindication that you've been set free. And those who have been set free are free what? Indeed. Hallelujah. Thank you. You're helping me preach this thing. That's good. And then number five, walk in the victory that we have received. If you do that, you will begin to experience, number one, his presence, the presence of God. We were praising this morning and worshiping. The presence of God was just flowing around, coming on us. You'll experience his presence. You will fulfill his purpose for your life. And you will receive the power to do that. His presence, his purpose, and then his power will flow through you. If you will do these five things, I believe this. This is how I live my life. This is how Jennifer lives her life. This is how, what we do. It's not head knowledge. This is heart. This is who we are. As I stand here speaking today, I hope you get that. One thing, this 